Uh, I'm Marco Sassoli, director of the Geneva Academy. I don't know anything about the subject. We have a moderator. I just wanted to introduce the moderator and our IT, which is uh, a very welcome. Uh, a number of new faces very shortly explain what is the Geneva Academy. By the way, a special welcome to the group from the University of Warsaw. I have to tell you that it was your university which brought me the first time in contact with the international humanitarian law in 1981. I followed there the summer school on humanitarian law and I would never have gone to humanitarian law. I was at that time purely in human rights law if there hadn't been Warsaw. But the Geneva Academy, very shortly, we are a joint center of the University of Geneva and the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies, and we have somehow three pillars of activities. Uh, one is three masters, and uh, those of you who are interested are welcome to follow either the master, uh, an LLM in uh, International Humanitarian Law and Human Rights, or a Master in Transitional Justice, or for professionals, an Executive Master in International Law applicable to armed conflict. And then we have a number of research projects, mainly uh, policy-oriented research projects, nevertheless based on international law. And we are a kind of platform, in particular more formalized, the Geneva Human Rights Platform. But here we are a kind of platform bringing together uh, academics, civil servants, uh, NGO representatives, and diplomats to discuss in this slightly more neutral place in Geneva issues of contemporary relevance in humanitarian law, human rights law, and one of the formats in which we do that are the IHL talks. And this talk today will be moderated by Professor Robin Geis, who is uh, since 2013 professor at the University of Glasgow. Before that, he was professor in Potsdam. And even before that, he worked several years with the International Committee of the Red Cross. And he is particularly well uh, qualified to, to moderate this panel because he has l worked a lot on cyber, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, global security, and he will be starting <coughs> 1st of January next year the Swiss IHL chair of the Geneva Academy, so we are looking forward to see him very often <coughs> in this position. Welcome. I give you the floor, uh, Rob. Well, thanks very much, uh, Marco. Great to be here. Great to be back in Geneva. Always sunny, always coming from Berlin. This is such a good feel, <laughs> the city. Um, it's also great to see such a, a good turn up at a 12.30 IHL <laughs> talk. Uh, but we have a fascinating uh, topic. And I'm not sure I'm so much an expert on the topic, but certainly our, our panelists uh, are. So uh, I mean, data processing and data protection is, uh, is a core element nowadays of, of every protection mandate. Uh, it's an essential part of work for any humanitarian organization. I think it probably is safe to say that it always has been. Uh, if you walk up to the ICRC Museum, uh, look at their prisoner of war archives, that's data collection right there. Just today, everything got a little bit faster uh, and a little bit uh, bigger, I would say. There's a lot of, speaking of big, there's a lot of buzzwords flying around. Big data, AI, um, blockchain, and so on. And I think buzzwords like these are always indicative that we're starting to come to grips with new developments, but that we're not quite there yet. I think it's an ongoing uh, field, ongoing uh, topic. Um, it's an emerging, still emerging and developing uh, technology. I think a lot of open questions are still out there. Uh, there's light and there's shadow. Uh, there's certainly a lot of opportunities for protection work, uh, but there are also certain risks. 
when it comes to uh, data protection issues, especially now that with the next wave, all the haystacks that we've been building with data collection, we can do that, I think. But AI is going to enable us to really pull all of this together. And I think that's really going to be the next wave and the next set of data protection challenges. Uh, so I'm delighted to say that we have a, a very great mix of uh, experts uh, gathered uh, at this panel. We'll start with uh, Anna Bedushi, who is a visiting research fellow here at the Geneva Academy and a senior lecturer of law at the University of Exeter. Um, and then uh, we'll continue with Vincent uh, Graf, who just learned that he'll be on this panel yesterday, uh, but then he's from the ICRC and they know how to respond to urgent uh, <laughs> demands. So um, he's a, a strategic uh, technological advisor to the ICRC, and he will be followed by Carmela Troncoso, who is a professor uh, at the uh, Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne. Okay, so we just start in that order, then I might have a question to the panelists and then we'll open up and we look forward to uh, um, a discussion with you. Thank you, I just need the um, sure. technological tools. Okay. Um, okay, well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation and uh, to the Geneva Academy and Emily in particular to, for the organization of this talk. So. Um, the, the talk that I'll be giving to you today relates quite closely to my research in the field uh, on new technologies and uh, questions of displacement and migration in general. Uh, I have to acknowledge that that relates to an ESRC, so Economic and Social Research Council funded project on digital identity, which I led uh, a few years ago, and uh, also to research relating to big data and um, artificial intelligence in the field of migration. Just before I start, uh, can I have just a show of hands, like just to understand wh where you're coming from? So how many people here have a lot of understanding of the area from the technical viewpoint? So show the hand, <laughs> nobody, that's good. How, how about, uh, so from, from human rights law? Yeah, so, and humanitarian law. So, okay. So, so, Kind of a good good mixture of people. So if at any point you want to interrupt me and ask questions about uh, if if I dive too much into the jargon, and I'll try not to because I have two technical specialists here. So my background is more in law uh, and international human rights law, uh, and I'll be trying not to uh, get too much into the technical details. So in order to do so, um, I'll be focusing on data protection and privacy from a, a more legal perspective. But in order to do that, I thought it would be good to give you a little bit of a sense of, um, let's put things into context. So let's imagine that this is Layla. So she's a, a refugee, Layla here. And uh, if she's in a camp, let's get it uh, in, into uh, a context, but not so specific. So if she's in a refugee camp, she would have two alternatives at this point in time. She would have perhaps uh, to leave the camp if she wants and, and perhaps face destitution in a in city or in another area, or she could stay in the camp and uh, be uh, enrolled there. But for that, perhaps, uh, and quite often it is the case at the moment, she would have to uh, consent to uh, give her biometric data to um, the organizations that would be running the camp. So by biometric data, I mean fingerprints, iris scans, because that's facilitating, in a way, the management of the camp, because that's good for uh, distributing cash aid to, to refugees, because that's interesting to avoid duplication of, uh, of benefits in the camp. But you may already start to think, well, uh, there might be a question of consent here because she might not have a choice in this sense. But well, still, so she would be, uh, so organizations would be collecting the uh, biometric data of this person, but would also be collecting a number of other information about Leila and perhaps her children and her situation of family. So for example, questions relating to her ethnicity her religion, her political preferences maybe, but also her name, date of birth, and, and these more uh, trivial types of uh, information. And so at some point, uh, and we see that happening quite a lot, a number of uh, private sector and sometimes academia 
uh, people like myself would start having these clever ideas and say, wow, international organizations, you have so much data that you have been collecting about Leila, so let's use it in a different way. And there are, for example, big data that we could also relate to these data sets that you already have, and biometrics, and many other technologies and that we could use. One of them would be to use this uh, digital attribute to uh, provide digital identification and identity verification of people. This is something that I have been looking a lot in the context of digital identity. So how to provide uh, identity verification or identification for people that don't have legal proof of identity, either because they're refugees and they lost the, 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 the documents that they had or because they're born uh, in a place where they were not registered at birth. And so it comes from a good uh, idea, and at the moment we have uh, a lot of talk in the industry about uh, using algorithmic uh, tools, so artificial intelligence very broadly conceived, uh, more likely some more rudimentary algorithmic uh, decision makes, so algorithms being like recipes to solve problems, right? So uh, using that in order to manage migration, so for example, uh, in order to know that Leila is Leila, we would use, uh, for example, natural language processing in order to verify quite quickly that her claim that she's from one region is truly correct. But there are a number of problems that come with that, and uh, I trust uh, my uh, colleagues here will be talking more about that. But from my perspective, I would want to ask a few central questions. For example, what are the true opportunities and risks to use these technologies. So obviously it would be good to know that Leila is Leila when she's collecting her cash aid at the camp or when she's collecting a number of benefits, but what are the risks of having this type of uh, technology implemented? So one of the risks in our scenario with Leila would be that she's uh, fleeing persecution from one state that is uh, persecuting her on the basis of her ethnicity, let's say, and the data that is collected by the international organization or the international organizations and NGOs and whoever working in the field would be uh, somehow communicated to third parties that then would somehow uh, not respect the uh, privacy and the data protection rules. And let's say that the state that is persecu persecuting this person would get access to all this information. That would facilitate, in a way, persecution. So that, that's a big risk. Then how are these risks being mitigated? So again, with international organizations and especially in the field of humanitarian action, the problem sometimes, well, which is a good thing, is that you, you have uh, immunities and privileges, but that also means that a number of rules do not apply uh, to, uh, to these international organizations in the field, but they may be sharing this data with third parties and sometimes with companies that would be using that and there is a risk there that uh, would be needing to be mitigated. And I trust that there are a number of guidelines to mitigate these risks, including the ICRC, um, working uh, a lot on that. But there are these risks and we should be looking at them. And then at the end of the day, uh, how would that create or exacerbate vulnerabilities for these populations, especially in the context of displacement, where we really have this difference of power between the organizations, the state, and the refugees or migrants themselves that would not have an option in a way. And uh, again, we come back to questions of consent uh, in relation to data protection and uh, their privacy in general. To that, uh, I would add that we live in we work in a field that is very complex, and it's highly complex not just because of the questions that are uh, related to exacerbating their vulnerabilities, but because you have a plurality of actors, so multiple, multiple stakeholders operating in this field, and especially when we come to technology, there are private and public interests that are conflated at the same time, and sometimes there are conflicting interests. So different stakeholders, different uh, sometimes conflicting interests, so industry that would think of uh, have developing projects, developing digital identity based on blockchain technology, for example, that would be 
a product that would be sold to international organizations, to states that would be using that, so the, the interests may be conflicting. And also different levels of uh, norms and legal frameworks that apply to this uh, field, very complex uh, regime of obligations if we think about states operating in the field, international organizations, but also businesses that do operate more and more in this field and then a uh, plurality of ever-evolving technologies. So the buzzwords, as uh, you're saying, in a year ago might have been blockchain. At the moment, we're talking about emotional AI and uh, so on. And, and the technology is evolving quite uh, a lot. We're talking more and more about, about gate analysis, about how uh, we walk and how our cell phones will pick the way in which we walk. And from there, we would infer a number of uh, attributes that we would have, including sexual orientation, including uh, gender, uh, etc. So that the, the technology is ever evolving. There is no limits for that, but there are a number of limits in, in the way in which the frameworks are organized. So this is where uh, we see this uh, complexity of uh, situations uh, happening. And if we go back to my example with Leila, well, at the end of the day, we're talking about a person. At the, at the end of the day, we're talking about several Leilas that would be uh, deserving protection and at the same time are being um, caught in uh, this, let's say, hype of using technology to perhaps protect these individuals, but uh, should be uh, taken into consideration to what uh, risks and to, to what extent that, that protection would be uh, provided to them. So, uh, not wanting to leave you in a very negative position uh, on that, so if we think about positive, so could there be solutions to uh, this uh, situation? Perhaps. So here are some, some kind of leads, some sort of uh, um, reflections uh, on that. So perhaps at the macro level, we could be thinking about applying minimum standards based on international human rights law and specific regulations, all, such as the GDPR, so the General Data Protection Regulation, in if EU data subjects are concerned, but more broadly, taking that as some sort of a standard that we could then apply in other domains. Following the perhaps the integration of if can do, so if states can do, if international organizations operating in the field can do, have the technological capability to do so, <coughs> must they do so? Should they do? Right? So if they, they can use uh, technology and, and use these minimum standards of international human rights law protection inside uh, these specific tools that they would be uh, using, could that be, uh, could that be the case? For example, uh, at meso level, we would have implementations of standards through uh, organizational measures uh, inside international organizations working with that. How does the protection of these individuals and uh, rules based on so rights-based approach, how it integrates the, uh, and trickles down the organizational measures of these uh, institutions? But also, can we work out data protection and privacy by design into the design of these products and make that a requirement? So when states, when international organizations are, let's say, buying tools that are uh, AI-based solutions, that are uh, blockchain-based solutions, or that would have uh, anything to do with technology, can we put on the procurement uh, rules that uh, they would have to follow these uh, specificities and include data protection and privacy in the design of uh, these products, which in the uh, GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, is uh, what we're going towards. And then on a micro level, we should uh, think that we should maintain the focus on the individual and not lose sight that uh, that's uh, First and foremost, uh, the individual that we're talking about. So, in my example, we're thinking about one Leila or several uh, Leilas and, and, and refugees that would be uh, being, uh, in a way, obliged to share uh, their information. And um, at some point, we need to think of a qualitative uh, change to integrate data protection and privacy rules into the daily practice of all the organizations operating in the field. Otherwise, we risk uh, to have the privacy and the protection of 
all the rights of these individuals, so their safety, their, their security, or um, their refugee rights, not abide by these institutions that maybe want to do something well, but if these uh, rules on privacy and data protection are not taken into consideration, may end up uh, putting these people in uh, some situation of risk. So I think that's all for me. I try to <coughs> keep on the time. Thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to discussing that with all of you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Anna. Uh, another buzzword for me, emotional AI, which I understood to mean it's artificial intelligence that reads and interprets human emotions rather than trying to replicate them. So uh, over to you. Thank you. Uh, it's okay if I stand more. Just whatever I'm works best. Used to. So I'm, I'm indeed stepping in for Massimo, my colleague, who's unfortunately sick. I have to say that surrounded by so many doctors, I feel quite safe here. <laughs> yes. All right, so uh, I want to talk a bit more about uh, the missing. So, I want to try to build a bit of a story around the missing that uh, have been mentioned by, by Robin earlier. Uh, so missing really is about people that actually go missing in war. And this is about our mandate to make sure that with no rest, we just uh, look for uh, informing their loved ones, their families, what happened to them. Clarifying the fate of the missing is something you, you probably have all heard. You mentioned it as well, so you know, we haven't time really to coordinate. But <laughs> So we've been collecting data for decades, right? That is what was happening actually in Geneva during World War II. This is all the staff looking at the cards, you know, the punch cards at the time that were about prisoners of war. Right? Now at the museum, we still have the archives of the first World War prisoners of war, all the missing cases that we have. And so we've collected data, but we've also always tried to find the right processes and tools so that we can do something with that data. And this is, of course, what we call technology. Now, apart from the fact that it might be cool to have technology, I think we, we have to acknowledge that we have a certain moral obligation to actually use uh, uh, technology to improve our capacity to resolve these cases. Whatever this is about, we're not going to implement it, right? Because I really studied and I'm going to go through a few examples after. But I think it's clear that we have to look at technology so that our impact in the field and our speed to resolve cases is better. So let's imagine a small story. Uh, we have a fantastic complex machine, so superb algorithms, uh, um, that is suddenly sending an alert somewhere. You know, there have been a match from a very old case. You know, this, this mother had been looking for a son for five or ten years, perhaps. And all of a sudden, this machine, sitting perhaps at the ICRC, finds a match and raises an alert. So, this is a story for the purpose of the talk, but it's actually something we are doing somehow. So we are working today on building systems that can help us searching through the vast amount of data. Right? So this is about some of these buzzwords, so uh, the actual intelligence arts. We do use natural language processing to be better at finding names. So finding names in lists, you know, big Excel list, first name, last name. But that doesn't work because you have the cultural aspect. You have all the special uh, local uh, contextual uh, cases that makes this thing uh, pretty difficult, whether it's translation, transliteration, etc. We do use facial recognition too because it is known, apparently, that that is one of the most mature elements or area of artificial intelligence. And it's actually banned in some places. But in our case, again, we've been collecting data, we have data, we have to look at it in a certain way. And we're looking at things which are even a bit more complicated, which goes totally towards the data protection and privacy elements. It's like when you want to search across the data, how do you, can you do this without sharing too much of your information, without even actually sharing what you're looking for? Because of course, a digital trace is much easier to use for persecution down the road. Just by saying what you look for, we'll create more data that potential adversarial uh, uh, um, entities will, will use against you. Data, this is about our data, the one we collect, and we've been collecting for, uh, for decades, as I mentioned. But it's also about public data. So of course, we have to look at what is available out there. Now, what is public? That's precisely the point that Anna was, I think, making, is that we have to have the process in place 
to look at what this means. It, you know, public data in the sense that you can use it freely, that doesn't really exist, does it? I don't know. What about the consent? Who is in charge of, of looking at this? What is about the processing of data from a legal standpoint? So all these things, this is quite critical. Our field experience. So whenever we build algorithms, we should embed our field experience and our, again, decades of knowledge about what is happening out there. What, is the, what are the cultural elements? What is, what is special about a certain place, certain conflict, certain time, so that when you search for missing, you take this thing into account. The trust, that's something we are, of course, uh, uh, super uh, uh, cautious with, in the sense that we've be, we are and we will always be there. The proximity with, with affected uh, populations uh, uh, is something we're very proud of and we keep on doing. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we also see that the trust is somehow eroding nowadays. Right? So trust into institutions uh, is eroding in many areas of the society. And that's something we have to be very careful with uh, so that our you know, neutrality, independence and impartiality is always maintained. And something, uh, another critical element we have to take into account when building this system is, is the network in general called the ecosystem, you know, perhaps another buzzword as well. But I'm talking, of course, about the Red, uh, um, uh, Red Cross and Red Christian societies uh, of the world, which is particular to us, but it's also other international organizations and some NGOs, right? And it's about states and partners. So all these people nowadays have either trust data we can use, knowledge we can leverage to do things better, or, or, uh, or just can help us, you know, being more present in there. So again, the point of this is really to say that we're working on it, but that there are many, uh, many things to take into account. Oops, that's sorry. So what can go wrong when we do these kind of things? Back to the story. The alert has been bringing, so system that is a match for, for this old case. Perhaps it's just a wrong prediction, right? So the algorithms was badly built, and we have, of course, biases in the things whether they are prejudicial biases, so your training data was taking into account the wrong or using the wrong uh, set of, of data. <coughs> Racial bias is extremely well known, or gender biases. But you have some other biases. Uh, you have uh, one which is probably even more difficult to, to, to tackle and has usually more, uh, more bad effects, is when you really train a system on something which is not the situation, you're gonna use it in, in, in the, on, on the field, right? So these are biases a bit more complicated to find. There would be a, probably a lack of dignity in the sense that if a system suddenly sends an SMS to someone and it's automated decision, so there'd been a system calculating a probability to say it seems that in this case match your request, I'm going to tell you that's really bad. I mean that doesn't respect the dignity of people that have been looking for their loved ones for so long. So we cannot replace humans. That's pretty much our point there. Interpretability. Interpretability of the system. So understanding exactly how the decision is made. Again, the bias is usually, or not usually, but often an explanation of that result, but it goes much, much deeper than that, right? So how is your system built? How is this probability calculated? What is the threshold which is applied to say it's a match, it's not a match? You know, what is, you know, a negative, uh, uh, sorry, uh, um, when you have um, uh, the, the wrong estimation in terms of uh, of whether you accept a wrong result or you deny the potential match, all these kind of things we have to really pay attention from an individual perspective to understand this. This brings to actually no accountability. If you don't respect these things, you cannot claim you're accountable. And this is something else we're very uh, uh, careful with. I mean, we do have to be more accountable to the affected populations. Now, if you don't understand what's going on, if you don't respect the dignity, how can you claim you have accountability? And at the end, I think, or again, not in terms of priority, but at the end, all these kind of things boil down to data protection and privacy challenges, but in a bigger picture than what most of the people consider. And I'll, I'll get back to that a bit, a bit later. <coughs> so I, I just went through some explanation, but why is that kind of thing happening as well? And my point here is that new technology is actually getting more complicated every day rather than more simple. Right? A lot of people think that, oh, I can go in the cloud and click and get some access to some machines and deploy AI and build a mobile app. But precisely because these things can be done in a few clicks for anyone for not so, so much money, it's because it is extremely more complicated than both. 
when you get systems, you know, you have to look at your data. Is, is my data properly uh, uh, prepared? Right? Have, have I made the right analysis on the feed? Have I looked at the right variable? Am I really sure about the impact on, on what I'm measuring? You then build, build, build the so-called pipelines, right? So end-to-end -end pipelines for managing your data from the capture preparation, processing it, going through some machine learning algorithms, etc., to produce a prediction. That's pretty hard to actually set up because every line of code pretty much uh, can, can bring a, an error or a bug in the system. And then, of course, the data, the way you manage data, the personal data, it's stored in some kinds of database, whatever you call it. But these choices are extremely critical and usually typically security at the end. When you make a design decision to say, oh, you know, I think we're quite safe here, we're pretty good, you know, the system is actually under my desk and I'm just going to build a giant database. And, or quite the opposite, oh, no, I think it's fine, you know, we can go to the cloud, public cloud, and so things there. These decisions are extremely uh, uh, important to make and not always so easy to, to really make uh, from a, um, on an informed basis. The governance is also uh, something that uh, has a lot of importance from the ground up. Uh, you know, do you want to look at some automated decision making? What are your processes to really look at what the system can produce? The data sharing, we touched upon. Um, so there will be a moment where data is shared, whether it's just geographically speaking, so within your organization, between countries, may have the legal implication, between organizations, with private, public, etc. So that's very important. Data protection privacy framework, uh, not going more into detail. Independence towards suppliers. That's another one that I, I, I like to emphasize on from a technical standpoint. So, of course, you know, being able to fire your supplier at any point for any system is quite critical for, for humanitarian in particular or, or civil society for, for saying right. So you must be able at any time, whatever you build things, whatever you work with, you should always be, have actually a way to fire them and build differently so your system and your services uh, to the affected population are, are still running. Uh, black box versus interpretability, th that's also something I just uh, mentioned earlier. But again, benefits are there, right? So there are some benefits, and, and I'm not going to go through an exhaustive list of, it, of them, but you know, I can cite a few here. So that, this system will bring us more capacity to use more information, and there, there is value into managing and looking at information for, for helping decision making, right? There's no question about that. Uh, this system allows us to bring or to build new relationship between events. So uh, an example is we have a colleague working on how can we find the missing in the sense of the dead missing, right? So typically mm -hmm. dead migrants in the sea. And they've been working uh, on the Catania case, so this ship that uh, sunk with allegedly 800 people, uh, uh, dead people in it. There was 28 survivors, right? There was obviously no passenger manifesto, no list of the people, and roughly 10% had some uh, IDs in their pocket. How can you ever look and uh, try to, 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 uh, to identify these people? There are other ways of using technology where by collecting more information, you know, sort of briefing or debriefing survivors, families, perhaps smugglers even, or, or other, other sort of first aid responders, you can get some data that at the end could actually build new relationship that a human eye would not see. Right? We call that complex network. Possibility to rerun search and fairness with all cases. So obviously, uh, you know, there are cases which are 60, 70 years old. I was still looking every so often, but because they pile up and add things to the first, you need more capacity to do things. Now, what if we could have a way by which a human set up the right search, really, you know, by, by putting our, our knowledge into it, and that the machine regularly pull new data and check whether uh, a hit <coughs> is made. That is quite interesting. And collaboration with research, I mean by research, any kind of research and development, essentially academic, but also of course private sectors. So whenever we have, this is interesting because why going towards the buzzwords, which obviously brings a lot of <coughs> visibility to all researchers, it helps us also to leverage their capacity to help us. So it kind of a win-win thing. Just a few benefits here. Now, the takeaway is, is a theorem. Um, so I think my theorem here would be that data protection brings a lot more than compliance. Right? It is also about compliance, but it's a lot more than that. The obvious reason is that protection, with a big P, is really at the core of all the internal activities. Right? It has different ways of being said, but that's really what we do. Data, it's today and for a long time, I suppose, 
the biggest source of innovation, of bringing money and bringing new services to the population, you know, you know, adding to well-being, etc. But it's also the biggest source of data breaches, of you know, enabling some organization to target people, make persecution faster. It's also the big reason, because you have so much data everywhere that you have uh, the cyber attacks. So actually, some people are willing to get money by doing cyber attacks on big data. Uh, and then it's also the, the fake Xing, so fake everything. That's what I mean by that, right? So fake disinformation, all these kind of things. This comes because we have data. So data protection, plus plus, so I don't know how to call it, which is about bringing the rigor of the law, or the laws, right, that either people, practitioners, lawyers usually have, but also because it has a, a lot of thinking behind it, despite we think law is usually boring, it has some kind of nice thinking behind. When you complete it with really the cyber security element, so when you take into account security of information at large, this is also part of data protection to me, precisely because we talk about protecting data, which is about protecting people at the end of the day, right? And it has another super critical element, which is the independence with regards to the objectives of any business process, right? So whether you are in business and the objective is to money or busy, or whether it's about saving uh, uh, people like us, every unit, team, division, whatever you call it, has an objective, and data protection, when properly set up, you have this independence. And that's the only way where you can really uh, make sure that you, you protect people the right way. So, the, the reason I'm here is actually to uh, tell people that yes, we use technology and we have to look at using technology to improve our impact. But at the end of the day, the reason I'm here talking is really to make sure that whoever is involved in this, we, we make sure that in the digital realm as well, we really try to do no harm. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, another uh, batch of buzzwords, I guess. Digital <laughs> trace is what I took away. But what I thought was particularly interesting is that you said that certain decisions cannot be taken away from humans. Um, that's maybe something we should look into in our discussion. Mm -hmm. Coincidentally, today they are a meeting at the UN to discuss which decisions in weapon systems uh, need to, to be taken by humans. So it's interesting to see how human dignity works with weapons and maybe in other fields. We should come back to that. So over to Carmela Troncoso. So hi, um, I'm probably the more technical here. Um, I was asked to give a technical perspective on a bunch of technologies, so you ready? Um, I have compressed like 20 hours maybe of lectures in 15 minutes, and I'm gonna use a lot of technical passwords, and I decided to do that instead of going to depth in one to give you vocabulary so that you can search more information on these different topics, uh, my slides will be made available. So, as a, a kind of apart from, from when this is uh, finished with this digitalization, <coughs> yes, yeah, sure, it is great, but we need to understand the risks that come with it. Um, and I will tell you, I mean, you cannot live nowadays without machine learning and AI, without the blockchain, and without connecting everything to everything. And that is true, these things are awesome. We just uh, heard a bunch of examples about how they can improve. But with great power it comes great responsibility and we need to understand how to use them in order to not cause more harm. So let me go a little bit about how when we go to the lower level, when we go to the technology, how all of these passwords, what does this actually mean when we do them? So about connectivity, the very important thing to take into account is that when we connect in the digital world, then all of our physical ideas of protection do not apply anymore. The network is not physical, there are no walls, there are no windows, there are no distances, because we can listen everywhere, yeah? So, imagine here somebody, um, I made this a while ago for some workers on uh, migration offices to search uh, information about migrants asking for asylum. So imagine that somebody is just saying, hey, can I just check about this person, who they are? And that could be also the same case if you were saying, the refugee camp for Leila, who is Leila? Should I give her uh, some help or not? So we're searching for this thing. Now what happens when this um, happens to the network, what normally happens is that it's an adversary. And the adversary is extremely powerful and can be a lot of people. 
Um, so normally we think about intelligent agencies, but you could even have more local adversaries, anybody that's actually in your network, like your uh, sysadmins at the organization, the internet service provider, or even anyone that is around you, right? Um, so uh, this year in my bachelor course, we just making an exercise where we show them how easy it is to eavesdrop on, on, a, on a communication, something you can learn actually in 20 minutes. Uh, we had um, a month ago at EPFL in the open day, a small exercise for that, that people, we, they were with us for one hour and then they were learning how to eavesdrop on any Wi-Fi anywhere in the world. Um, we told them don't use this yeah. at home. <laughs> Okay, but we're fine because we have encryption and now the person is very sad because he cannot read anymore um, all of this information. And whenever we have encryption, now we need to think, um, encryption is something that reduces the um, security of the information, the security of the key, the key that encrypts. And uh, normally we hear this, this is another buzzword nowadays, end-to-end -end encryption, which is great because that means that our adversary cannot see and it's very sad. But it is very important to think what is an end when we talk about end-to-end -end encryption. When you do an end-to-end -to, -end to Facebook, you are an end, but the other end is Facebook. It is not me. It is not the other side. That means that Facebook holds all of this information. So now our adversary can, instead of using his power, can use his power of subpoena um, to actually go to Facebook and have this data. That means that every time, as Vincent was saying, we have a digital trace, we have to think about which are the third parties uh, that we have around that can talk. Um, what about messaging? When we hear about end-to-end -end encryption and email messaging, we normally actually are talking about real end-to-end. -end. This works both for uh, some email services as well as IMs. Um, yeah, so we have this thing, it's, it's very nice. Uh, if we don't have this encryption, in some cases, like when we talk with Gmail, Gmail actually can decrypt and then would encrypt back to the receiver. So again, this server, we need to understand what is the end of the encryption. And we also need to understand that even if you have real end-to-end, -end, like all of the messengers nowadays, all of these still have available metadata. Even Signal, which is the most uh, protected um, messenger nowadays, has metadata available. What does that mean? That in order to know who, where to send the messages, Signal takes all of your contact from your phone and effectively they take all of them and they have them stored somewhere. Yeah, and then they can find who talks with whom because they need to connect you. They know when you talk to them, how, uh, for how long, how often. And this is uh, this may be a lot of information. We're talking about refugees or about people who are actually just the very fact that you are contacting them may actually put them into risk. Um, so one of the alternatives and where do we stand in terms of technology <coughs> for this, uh, for browsing, using the Tor browser will help you a lot. Uh, in the case when you're browsing Facebook, you still need to have a fake account on Facebook. Um, I don't have enough time to talk about this, but it is very hard to actually create fake accounts that are not linkable to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, if somebody has this problem, we would be happy to talk with them and to try to help them understanding what are the risks and, and how does this work. Um, always use encryption for email. Nowadays there is an initiative called Autocrypt that is making encryption easier and easier so that you don't have to hear about keys or this thing called PGP that may be your own the biggest nightmare and it's already in uh, some um, <coughs> mail agents, not sadly not yet on Outlook and the big ones, but just on the smaller ones and if you care about the privacy of the content, it's very important. I do not know about any instant messaging that really does truly privacy preserving, including the contacts nowadays. Sadly enough, we have not yet solved that problem. And in general, this idea of whenever you put data somewhere that can be a subpoena, an attack, a hacker that comes there, it is very, very important to realize where this end-to-end -end encryption ends and where the data actually um, relies. And I'm also talking, I have to talk offline about places where um, the platform may be centralized, but you can still encrypt some of the data for shared documents, for uh, shared um, editing. I mean, they are not as fancy as Google Docs, but they are kind of still very useful when you really care about um, the security and privacy. So with machine learning and AI, this is the most technical slide I have. Um, how this machine learning thingy works, you have some examples that you use to train and you give them some labels 
we convert the samples to features. So we were saying before we had Leila, and then we said uh, her gender, her ethnicity, her uh, color of her eyes, or whatever, anything that we call the features. Uh, and that is trained in order to get a model. And a model is just a thing that allows you to either classify or predict. And then on the field, you will give a new sample, like a new person, and then it will predict. Does this person need help? Does he need help? How often is, are they going to come to the camp? Or I, like, whatever is the question. <coughs> now, an important to, uh, thing to understand here is that these two parts, they come from our system. So in general, they are safe. But these two parts, we don't know where they come from. And as we don't know where they come from, an adversary may be the one um, giving uh, this information. So what happens here? What can this adversary do? And I'm just going to brush uh, this over. If we allow the adversary to give us samples for training, what they can do is something that's called poisoning, poisoning the model. That means that they can corrupt the model. Uh, they can do poisoning to just destroy the utility so that it doesn't give correct predictions anymore. Or they can even be more targeted, and then they can do this thing that we call backdooring. What, what they do is to um, make sure that the model works well for all the samples, except for one particular one. So they may ensure that when a particular person comes and this photo is seen, then there is a trigger in the model, and the model misclassifies. Yes, <coughs> And we can have any, uh, in that spectrum, we can go from full destruction to just misclassify a particular class to misclassify this particular sample. And we have the power, if you enable the adversary to play enough with those, he can actually do whatever he wants with the model. And on the testing phase, that means when the model is under deployment, uh, one thing that we can do is to steal the model. Why is it important to steal the model will come uh, in a couple of the slides. But what you can do is just by interacting with the model, you can actually learn what is inside this box. This black box that um, Vincent was saying, you can have an adversary interacting with it and extracting the information about the model. And that in turn may give a lot of information about what happened behind with this data. And the other thing that may be more dangerous in your case is actually what I call the cell examples. Probably you have seen the panda that looks like a gibbon at some point in your life, or the stop sign that the car doesn't stop. Yeah? So these are um, things that really look like the real thing, but we made a small change, and a change that is in general imperceptible for humans, but it will fool the machine. Why is this relevant? Because if now people start to know that you're using AI, they may modify the record in very simple stages. So for instance, Leila could say that instead of being 36, she's 37, and try to change a little bit or change the color of her eyes with some uh, lenses or something like that, and just trigger your model to give the wrong uh, output. And uh, we have algorithms to do this in a very efficient way and almost for any problem, even if we don't know the content of the model, even if we don't know how this was trained. Um, so what about privacy risks? Um, we have here, here, like, okay, all of the privacy is normally because we collect data. But when we know a bit more about this, um, so yes, indeed, that is a problem. The model itself encodes enough information from the data to be a uh, privacy risk. But also, it turns out that you need to give samples. Uh, Vincent was saying that this, when they um, want to connect in the network and they want to find someone, they have to give data about these people to somebody else. Now, that is also a privacy problem. And the label, in, the label in and on itself may be a privacy problematic. We can learn so much about people. Like this machine learning is amazing. So we are just going to give some information from Leila, and suddenly we're going to learn that she likes vanilla ice cream on Mondays. <laughs> and uh, it may be a threat to privacy even if you didn't want to participate in the model. The fact that more and more we collect data from all of these social networks, we may be violating privacy from many other people without even realizing. Um, so about this needed data to learn, can we solve this thing? Uh, data is highly unique. This is very hard. We don't know how to anonymize data. There are so many dimensions. There is always one little piece of data that actually allows you to re-identify. Re and when we thought about collecting noisy data, this is something on the power of the big companies that have billions of users. And, then, and therefore, they can afford to have a little bit of noise in each of them. When you actually are dealing with the small populations, just on a camp or just uh, a small etnia, I don't believe that we can really put enough uh, noise 
to protect privacy and at the same time get utility out of it. And uh, synthetic data is something that maybe you have heard from and people are pushing it as the next breakthrough in data science. Um, I don't know, I'm not very sure. We're working right now in trying to provide ways of evaluating the privacy of synthetic data, how much uh, information from the original data they have. So far, I'm very ambivalent that you can really build good synthetic data for your machine learning models and still have privacy, but it will come later. And if we think about data minimization, this is very hard because we don't know what data is needed. If we knew what data is needed, we didn't have machine learning. So many times you need machine learning to actually understand how to fit the machine. And then you enter in this chicken egg problem, uh, which actually we don't know how to solve. The problem number two is that, as I said, the model covers a lot of information. The model remembers this is an experiment from colleagues from Tana Mellon University, where they were testing a face recognition app a uh, physical recognition model, so this is the actual sample that which is in portraying the model, and this is what they reconstructed by just asking the model different questions to learn which kind of pixels the model had seen before, so they could reconstruct the full database of faces, and it is not exactly the same, but it's uh, pretty scary. Um, then for this idea that we need to give samples um, whenever we're going to interact with machine learning somewhere else, um, the current uh, trend to go there is to use encryption, but using encryption is hard, requires a lot of expertise to be deployed. We don't have that many people that can do these things, and it's very expensive because it uh, increases the bandwidth and computation that you need, so it's not something that you can do everywhere, and uh, it is very hard to modify. And nowadays we are allowed to do this agile thing where we want to change the functionality of everything all the time. That is something that cryptography cannot do very well, so I call this a new hope, uh, but we know how the movie ends. Um, <laughs> so the problem <coughs> four is that once you give labels, it turns out that the label also encodes a lot of information about what it has seen before because of this idea that the model remembers also encodes this information when it outputs. So we have a lot of uh, attacks that work a little bit like mastermind. I have here uh, people that are, uh, don't be offended because when I go in my class and I show this, they are like, what is that? <laughs> yeah, that is not in my, there's no app that looks like that. Um, but most of the attacks are kind of mastermind-like and they allow us to recover the training inputs. So what was the input? Was this person inside the database or not? Now imagine that this is a model from one of you where you use <coughs> refugees to actually train your model. If now I can test whether this photo I have here was used to train the model, I may be able to infer that this person actually was registered as a refugee and would come therefore endangering them. Um, <coughs> it allows us to even recover attributes from these people and know something about them, what was their uh, disease, things like this. And as we said before, we can even recover the model itself, and then that makes all of the above even more problematic. <coughs> and the uh, machine itself, you know, whatever as we said, poor Leila, the things we're going to learn about her and she doesn't know even. Um, so what about data protection? Uh, it is very hard to apply. I don't really know how to deal with data subjects rights. Is my data there or not? Models train on other models, are train on other models and public data. We don't know what happens with that. Um, transparency, we knew what machine learning is doing, it would be great. Um, the right to be forgotten and deletion is also very hard. When we have data on a model, and if I just get the model, how can I delete your data from there? Um, purpose limitation and data limitation. I, uh, limiting purpose is so hard because the machine learns all of these different things that we don't even know it's learning. Uh, I can also give another full lecture about that. And we don't know how much information is in there. If we knew that, again, we wouldn't need the machine learning in the beginning. But when we start extracting, we don't know where it stops. And um, consent, uh, well, I mean, as we said, once you have machine learning being pervasive all around the place, it's very hard to ask people to uh, give consent when they don't even know when the data is going to be used. And um, getting to the end, there are many more issues with deploying machine learning in the wild. 
we were in the lab, our cat is always warm and fluffy, you know, we just took by, yeah, he's great. Mm -hmm. Now, in reality, he just went out in the rain and there was mud, and when he came back, and your Alexa trying to, you know, check if it was your cat, it's not going to let him in. And this is because in the wild, things don't look like in the lab. So there are many uh, different problems that we have. We, uh, once talk about bias, uh, we have the base threats fallacy, it's also the prosecutor. Mm -hmm. Prosecutor fallacy. The prosecutor fallacy, uh, which says that when you're looking for something that is a needle in the haystack, the possibility that you find a false positive, the possibility mm -hmm. that you make a mistake is so much higher, uh, we can do the math, but for many of the things that you guys look into, this may be the case. Refugees are exceptions all the time. So trying to apply machine learning algorithms that look for majority things may actually result in many errors that this need to be studied. We talk about adversarial machine learning threats. Um, we have this problem of distributional shift. What happens when I train in a population? Yeah, I train in a country, I train in Syria, and then I try to apply the same thing in Iran. Like horrible things happen. We also have uh, the distribution of errors. Even though you may think that your algorithm is very nice because it has 90% accuracy, it may be that the 10% error is only made on one particular class of the population. We should never look only at averages. We need to look at all of the possible subgroups. And all this becomes very difficult because how many subgroups do you have? How do you know that you have looked at all of them and you actually are not discriminating on one particular dimension? And I'm happy to talk about some of the others, but I guess I'm running out of time. So the alternative is maybe don't use machine learning. Sometimes uh, very basic stats give you very similar results. So think twice before going and collecting all of this data and try to apply it in the wild, because there may be more simple ways of uh, doing this without the data in privacy and with it running into risks of breaching bias and fairness. And about the blockchain, uh, <coughs> Like any diagram you find, it only has one thing where you need the blockchain, and the rest of the others, you don't need the blockchain, so you got, you don't. Um, so if you don't really need something that has a tampering, persistent log, like something that allows you to check things over time, you really can do with the normal database. And the problem with blockchains is that they are immutable. That's what they do. So once you put something there, we cannot delete it. That's their property. So now when we're talking about sensitive data, data from refugees, we have to think twice before putting it on a place that can never be deleted. And uh, I don't even want to go on the blockchain as an identity management system. I don't think we need it at all. I don't even think that for many of the humanitarian cases, you even need identity. In the case of Leila here, we're talking about the application, so we don't want to give food twice to the same person. But it's not that we don't win, uh, want to give twice food to Leila. I mean, we don't have anything particular against Leila. It's like any person. Um, or we don't want to, uh, the, the kind of things that we want to do and we want to preserve. And uh, the more conversation we have with ICRC, we're now working with them and trying to propose one of the ways where we have privacy preserving ways of doing this, of actually proving that I'm a person that did not receive food before without saying I'm Carmela, or what is my gender, and let alone give my biometric that may have much more information about myself. So, in general, the answer is yes, but. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, that was fascinating. Uh, and a lot of hands-on tips on what you should do when you browse the internet, I guess. Um, can I just, I mean, to, to open the debate and, and to give everyone in the audience uh, two minutes to reflect on the questions they might have. I have a general question to all panelists, because we've been discussing risks and so on, but do we know of incidents where humanitarian data in particular has been abused? Has any government that has been the source of persecution, do, do we have evidence, has there been a public incident where they have actually tried to get that data to trace people further that they have persecuted in the first place? Um, are we aware of major humanitarian data incidents? Just is, is there, I, I know you can't give away any secrets, but maybe from other organizations or public knowledge, uh, I think that would be very interesting. Camila, from your presentation, I kind of took away, and I'm re really simplifying, but privacy is pretty dead. And I'm wondering whether you would agree to that. 
And no, then I would not agree. Okay. I mean, privacy is dead if you just put everything in place. But the, the thing is that if you actually, um, and, and I didn't have like a had the negative side, like it could not give the positive side of the technologies we have to put into place to create a lot of these uh, solutions that we have here uh, in a privacy preserving way. Like as we were saying with this identity, like there are many alternatives. Uh, we also talked with ICRC about how can we do these matchings of uh, different databases without showing one database what the other is querying. There is a lot of technology like this. These technologies in general, they don't have much business in the real world. Companies make much more money from doing the easy, um, give me all the data, as Van Sang was saying, I'm going to hide all of the complexity from you. Uh, but these technologies exist. And, and, and actually what I have found uh, with my work with ICRC is that the humanitarian sector is one of the sectors where they make a lot of sense. Uh, because when I talk to companies, the glass half empty. But you guys always see the glass half full because we are enabling a lot of things that could not be done before, but they just need to be done with a lot of care and in particular understanding what is each of the steps, what are the risks that you're introducing and taking them into account. But I wouldn't say that privacy is dead. Otherwise, why are we here? Okay, well, that, that's a hopeful note. I mean, the German, the German government is discussing uh, criminalizing the use of the Tor uh, browser to uh, de anonymize any traffic on the internet. Uh, and I mean, just from, from all the technologies we're discussing, how much data will be pulled together in the future? Um, maybe it's not dead, and it's very good to hear it from a technical expert that you don't think it's dead, but certainly under threat, right? And, and to answer the other question, I mean, this, the only example I have about data being repurposed is in the US, a database that was built to find terrorists, that, uh, sorry, that was built to uh, find a uh, to prosecute child pornography, um, they have, yeah, can we check here? So they pull a lot of uh, photos from social networks to uh, process them in a yeah, kind of privacy, confidential way. And this was tapped then to find terrorists, right? So the moment the data is there, that's the other question. Like, we cannot have that many examples maybe about these things because none of this has been fully mm -hmm. uh, deployed yet. But the moment that the data is there, we can be sure that somebody will want to get hold of it. Right. Vincent, to you, I also had the question whether do you, do, you have, do you know of any statistics in the humanitarian field how things have improved through the use of data? Do we have statistics saying that now uh, we can deal with 1,000 refugees in two hours, whereas before using data, we could only register 25, because we had to do it orally and without biometrics, and it had to be written down, and it needed to be a translator. Do, do we have any kind of Statistics indicating the kind of improvements? So I, I, I'm not aware of these uh, approved statistics and, and talking more on my own behalf, I think that a lot of the current exercises, initiatives have been targeting a, a pure sort of uh, um, improvement into the speed and cost, which really is nowhere near to be so-called beneficiary centric, but really more either organizational and probably donor centric. So. There is a lot of potential, but I've never seen the statistics, and I kind of doubt they will really be calculated for for various reasons. In the sense, again, if if it's to you know have less people working on the case, or God knows what, you know, it's not going to be so fast. And to come back to the um, known cases, I, I'm just going to cite a few things. When Snowden files went out, if you go now to the search for ICRC keyword, you find one hit, right? Essentially, which is um, a presentation that is talking about the possibility to track a person of interest. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, understand Ben Laden essentially, uh, where potentially the guy may have some special diseases which one by one do not make a lot of sense, but combined do, in particular if the people who are bringing the medicines are a certain kind of organization and that this shipping goes to a certain place where we think the person can be. So it's kind of a usage of big data for locating, targeting people. Then others are, are I think it was last week if I'm not mistaken, but Twitter actually had two employees that were uh, paid by a uh, government, a Middle East government, for spying and providing lists of you know, names and connections and personal data to, to a government. Um, so yes, it happens. There was other use cases of other uh, human rights activists that have been targeted by sure. zero days exploits that other governments, again, have paid for. So I, I think, I guess that the, the final answer is probably that 
there's been the Me Too movement a while back, right? And it started in like Hollywood and stuff and went to some other corporate and probably government. And it ended up, as we know, unfortunately, into uh, humanitarian sectors, right? Uh, with the scandal last year. Data breach, we've seen it in corporate, we've seen it in government. When is it going to come to our sectors, I think? Okay, and then my final question, uh, Anna, to you, because you were speaking rightly, uh, I think, of human rights. Mm -hmm. But within human rights law, and with now, I mean, moving into emotional AI, um, <laughs> synthetic uh, data, possibly, and so on, do you, do you see areas where, where human rights might not be, human rights law might not be sufficient? What, what are kind of the pressure points where you think they are reaching the limits of what we can do with interpretation? And of course, the law is dynamic, and it's not a big issue that they didn't anticipate all of this when they drafted the human rights treaties we can dynamically interpret, but are we reaching the limits of that in some regards with artificial intelligence in particular mm -hmm. and big data? Do we, do we need something else? Do we need a, a new human right or a refinement of the right to privacy? Okay. Well, wow. so in, in, in the opposite order, starting with your first question about the incidents, uh, yeah, there, there are a number of incidents that relate also to like sharing data uh, to private companies and uh, I'll, I'll give you one uh, example that I am quite concerned about uh, which, which relates to, to the refugees uh, side. So uh, you're all aware of uh, the, the situation of the Rohingya minority in, in Bangladesh and Myanmar and uh, when uh, we had, the, after the 2015-2016 so-called crisis of uh, migration, we had a number of private uh, entities, so startup companies, tech companies that started coming to this field and uh, elaborating different type of technologies to help, right? So you have, for example, uh, one uh, of these initiatives called uh, the Ranger Project that uh, uses blockchain technology actually with biometric to, um, to provide identity to these people that uh, would be stateless at, at the basis. And so th there is a good point. They could then open a bank account, but if this information then is leaked and if there is a possibility of having um, cyber, uh, I don't say cyber attacks, but uh, a, a cyber incident uh, in, in, in this case, that would, uh, that, that would put these people that are already in a very vulnerable situation, even more vulnerable, consider that they would be voluntarily repatriated to Myanmar, right? So, so that, that's one uh, of these uh, situations where we can easily see the, the problem coming, like really uh, there at the door. And then to come to link it with your second question, um, I don't think that we need new uh, frameworks. I think international human rights law is a good framework and, and, and we could uh, extend uh, interpretation and even go further than just privacy and data protection. So if we're thinking about uh, other types of uh, technologies, so as, as you, I think you like the, the question of emotional, yeah, so trying to understand emotions uh, of people through, uh, let's say, face recognition, or uh, th there are a number of uh, um, scandals, I don't know if, if, if you have um, heard of this algorithm that would uh, identify by the way people walk and by the way that they pass to gate the, the, their sexual orientation, which could be very tremendously difficult and it's very inaccurate, uh, called gaydar. So that would be a very bad idea to do such a thing. So that would not just concern privacy and data protection, but that also touches questions relating to rights to private life, um, sexual orientation, questions relating to uh, many other rights if we think about using this type of technology in places where sexual orientation uh, would be uh, criminalized, for example. Mm -hmm. So rights to liberty, security. So there, uh, I just think that we need to translate what we, uh, in the legal scholarship, for example, understand for all these concepts and translate it into a way that would speak to the technical side and how we could integrate that into design. So, yes, uh, integrate privacy and data protection in the design of uh, new uh, technologies is now a requirement of the GDPR. So, having yeah. data protection by design and by default uh, would be a requirement. But can we extend that to other types of, uh, of uh, rights that we uh, 
want to have in the physical world and that we all agree that are also apply, applicable in the cyber universe. So th I think that's more what we need to do mm -hmm. instead of just keep regulating and keep <coughs> having guidelines and, 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 and new uh, declarations about to uh, Okay, right. well, and I think I understood from your presentation that if we all move in funny ways, we can confuse the algorithm, so it won't... The algorithm is bad. <laughs> okay, let's open this up. Uh, we still have a good 20 minutes. Any questions? Kubo. Uh, thank you all. This is really fascinating. Kubo much yeah. nice there. See, I, I, I would have questions for all of you, but I wanted to ask Carmel, building on what Robin said just a moment ago, you know, I don't know if privacy is bad, but uh, listening to your talk, I have the feeling that it might be too late already for a number of these things, that we are kind of rearranging, you know, chairs on the back chairs on Titanic. Because we ourselves have given so much of our data away voluntarily. Then as you rightly say, even if we haven't, even if we are one of those who are very careful, others have given information that can then be aggregated about ourselves. So is there a way of putting this genie back into the bottle? And if there is such a way, do you think it's a technical, technological way? Or do we need regulatory solutions to, to enable that? So I think it needs to be a mix. And it's to be a mix with a third thing that is society, okay? Because at the end of the day, uh, even though it looks like society doesn't have much power anymore, society has a lot of power. The power of the people should not be ever, you know, underestimated. Um, so, but from the technological perspective, I'm not going to talk about the law because I'm not a lawyer. Um, but from the technology perspective, which actually we have another line of work uh, where we're trying to do that, we're trying to build technologies that allow us to contest, to whenever somebody has a lot of information and data, try to find technological means to give support to people, to contest the power of the data and the power of the optimization. Optimization is killing society, and we're trying to find ways to even understand that. and. I am afraid that for some cases we may actually find out, as you just rightfully say, that it is too late mm. and the algorithm and these big companies have so much data that we don't even have ways of feeding fake information to contest this thing. So maybe not as individuals, but yes, as a society that may happen and uh, I'm going to call for many uh, uh, labor movements that are happening nowadays from different companies uh, like Uber drivers, uh, like this company in the US that brings uh, super food to you? Instacart. Instacart. And these people that are saying we're being oppressed by the fact that algorithms are mm -hmm. good at us and they are joining forces to be able to contest all of this. But that needs groups and that needs society. And we can only help. You know, I would push back on this idea that uh, as a technological expert, you should not comment on regulation. I think it's quite the contrary. I don't want to put you on the spot now and come up with a solution now. But I think it's very important that technological experts think about regulation. Because we lawyers, you know, I'm a lawyer, but we often don't have this understanding of what we could do to push the genie, if not back into the bottle, but at least make it smaller. Oh, so no, no, no. Don't, don't, don't get me wrong. Important. I absolutely think that the conversation with the lawyers and technologists must happen. Uh, if you look at my work, I do have work with lawyers. I work a lot with them. They have changed the way in which I build systems because the law is important. My systems need to live in the real framework. And it is also has been a fascinating experience to also see how they learn and how I understand all of this underlying because also thinking and like the, when GDPR says all privacy by design, we have been working for the last four years in trying to explain what that means from an engineering perspective, how we translate all of those, and how can we also explain this to lawyers so that they understand what does that mean when they say that sentence. It's very easy to say a sentence. It's very hard to build a system. Mm -hmm. And when I talk with my engineers, uh, when I was back in industry, and they say like, yeah, sure, but now I need to code. What do I code? Mm -hmm. How to do all of those things? There needs to be a lot of a conversation. What I said is I don't know whether the law has to change or not for that. The law is already very hard to implement right now to me, so, uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Marco, was that, yeah? Uh, sorry, I have a, uh, I'm a lawyer, a legal question, and then perhaps to any one of you who wants to answer whether I understood the, correctly that the weakest point is the human being in this whole story. 
Uh, but the legal question, is it my bias or would you agree, Anna, that uh, international data protection law exists mainly in Europe and that's it. And mm -hmm. everywhere else, obviously human rights law exists universally, but the uh, interpretation is not at all as developed on data protection issues mm -hmm as it is uh, in the European system. And my general question is simply, I have the impression that the main problem is that there are still too many people, a great majority of people, who simply don't see the problem, who simply say, I click yes when the machine asks, may I, and so on. Uh, and as long as there's a majority who doesn't see the problem, uh, Perhaps I'm a naive lawyer, but I think if the majority were seeing the problem and would say, I don't agree, then necessarily those using this technology would have to change because they would have no more clients on Google if everyone was clicking, no, I don't take that. Okay, should, should I start? Yeah, well, yes, you have a, a, a great point that uh, data protection is quite strong in uh, the European Union framework uh, with the general data protection regulation. Now what happens is that also there is a, a knock-on effect of, of the general data protection regulation outside of the EU. Perhaps because of Article 3 on uh, extraterritorial effects, meaning that any processing uh, of data that is done outside of the EU, insofar as it has uh, data coming from EU data subjects, would need to comply with this legislation. But also because, so some have uh, called it the new gold standard in, in, in the, the field, perhaps because of that, a number of states around the world are uh, trying to have their national uh, domestic legislation aligned to the GDPR in order to get what in the Commission is called a decosy decisions. So uh, at the moment, for example, Japan just had an adequacy decision uh, made, which means that the Japanese uh, domestic law on data protection is of a similar level as the GDPR, thus the, the industry uh, in Japan would be able to process data at the same level as uh, it would be in, in the EU. So Japan, Argentina, Israel, uh, on the top of my head, the US, insofar as the, the, the privacy shield is concerned, and a number of other states are applying for, for, for that. So there is this kind of extraterritorial reach of the GDPR, but you're completely right that data protection being a type of right that is a, a fundamental right in the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the EU, but not really, uh, so the American Convention will not talk about that, etc., is a little bit weaker. But there, I, in, to leave it in, put it in, in a positive spin, there is hope. I was this morning talking about uh, that with the, the, the data protection uh, officer from Ghana, uh, which is a country that has a, a new legislation on, on data protection that it maps very much the GDPR. So th there is this effect, and, and, and we're seeing that uh, happening in the field. Anyone else want to respond? Or? I want to respond that even though it is great that the law extends, uh, a lot of these technologies are data protection compliant, because being compliant with data protection does not mean do not collect mm -hmm. uh, the data. It means collect the data, uh, letting people know how they are going to use it. You're still collecting the data and you're still subject to subpoena. So for the humanitarian sector in many ways, and I think that also came a little bit in the, com in the comment from Vincent, is data protection plus plus. You need to think about many more things than being compliant because you're handling data that has much more power than perhaps the typical data. And on that, the other comment about um, people consenting to Google, we can have a full conversation about how big tech has taken over the world. But in the case of the humanitarian sector, that technology sometimes is even not there. So we're even at an early moment where we could even avoid the fact that people may have to consent and maybe without actually the capability for consent. Mm -hmm. But also consent is not the only way of getting data, right? Because you mm -hmm. can argue legitimacy for running my camp and then off you go. No, that's, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> there were some more questions. Given the time, we should take them yeah. en group, I would say. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm with a German mission here in Geneva. I don't work on humanitarian uh, affairs, but on human rights, and you touched on uh, on that in your question to Anna. 
Um, and I, I think it's more a comment than a question, so it's good that you're grouping it so you can cover up that I didn't have a question. Um, <laughs> but just in the last Human Rights Council, we, together with a group of countries, including Mexico, uh, and my colleagues in the corner back there, um, ran a resolution on uh, privacy and that had a focus on artificial intelligence and all of these aspects of facial recognition. We touched on biometric um, technologies. Um, and the, one of the core questions, I guess, was the question whether we think that new reg regulations actually need it or whether we think that current human rights systems are already covering uh, all those new technologies. And, and I think that's one of the conclusions that we also came to is the fact that, that human rights apply online and offline and that we, didn't, we, we don't consider that then there is a need for new regulation but existing regulation to be applied to new technologies. Um, and in that regard, um, I can also shamelessly plug um, that in the resolution that we ran uh, just a couple of weeks ago also mandates the Office of the High Commissioner to convene an uh, expert seminar on exactly that question of the interrelation between artificial intelligence and, and human rights. Because what we saw in the negotiations as well is that there is a couple of countries that are concerned about all the issues you were just rising, uh, raising on, on, on privacy, but there is also countries that have a, have a stronger focus on the, on the benefits. And if we look at humanitarian aid, if we look at the field of medicine, uh, we have to admit that there are benefits. So this is really a question about balancing really delicately between, between those two. <coughs> um, my, my question comes from the Geneva Academy. My question builds on the last one. I would like to hear maybe from the panelists uh, their observations or assessment on whether the existing forums, I mean, the Human Rights Council was mentioned, we are in multilateral Geneva, so to say, are effective enough to tackle these challenges, or we also would need institutional reforms or new for us? Or where are these discussions taking place? Where are decision making? Where is decision making taking place? And uh, are these current for us, the multilateral for us we have, effective enough to address these challenges we have? A final question. Uh, sorry, um, I. So a question that's still forming in my head because I'm trying to make sense of, uh, um, in view of a context where I come from, I'm from Africa, I'm from Uganda, I live in Geneva though. Um, from a human rights perspective, there's, um, I'm trying to say that there's a preoccupation with privacy. And it's, it's because I come from a context where human rights is understood less in the context of privacy and actually human rights is uh, slowly evolving towards privacy because um, there's a certain push towards um, privacy rights and um, which is naturally not the way in which human rights is thought of in that context and so i sense that the issue of privacy is not entirely i could say it's not a primary uh, concern because even in terms of societal construction privacy was never really uh, you know, an ethic in that sense. You know, you never really thought of privacy as a big um, issue within that kind of societal context. In fact, society was constructed in a way in which we all knew about our lives broadly, and we all had a responsibility to have an impact in each other's lives. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to, to see to see whether there's um, it's kind of counterintuitive in some senses where. There's not really a preoccupation with privacy, and perhaps this, um, you know, accelerates a particular way of thinking in particular contexts where this is not really uh, an issue. And you know, how does that relate with the broader discussion about privacy now? Because I think, you know, the discussion about privacy is driven by a particular um, construction and understanding, which is not necessarily representative. And I think uh, sometimes the preoccupation of privacy is not necessarily representative of how everyone views, you know, societal ethics and you know how we coexist in society. So it's just something you know that I was thinking about. That I'm not sure if I formed the question properly. Thank Thanks very much. That's a challenging question for yeah. everyone I, on the panel. I, I can quickly yes. start. Uh, a few things about regulation. The first one, I think. There is a need for new regulation, but perhaps not in the way you, you, you were thinking about it. Uh, from, from a technical standpoint, I think that even if you go on Alibaba and you purchase some electrical components like 100 pieces for half a dollar or half a franc, 
they all come with some kinds of explanation what the thing is good at and when it should be used and what are some of the sort of uh, um, you know uh, consideration safety wise to take right to use in AI if you download a data set or a model on internet you don't see this right so regulation to for example force uh, uh, com uh, tech companies or whoever developed these things to produce to, along with it like data sheets or something that explains what the thing is about, how it's good, how we can avoid the uh, the, the shift in distribution kind of things, all, all some other things. I think this kind of regulation is, is needed and that, that's one comment. The second is about privacy I think and, and talking about Japan because you mentioned Japan earlier, if I'm not mistaken uh, in Japan um, you're whether you belong to a trade union, this is not considered private information. So from a cultural standpoint, you're right. I mean, the, the, what, what do we mean by, I think, this privacy? This is something which also definitely needs to be not anchored, but at least built upon a, a broader, a broader uh, analysis of, of the, 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 the feeling or, or the, the, yeah, what people think from a cultural standpoint as well. Camilla, final reflections? For so, today. Um, I'm again going to kind of avoid the legal one and I'm going to go with that. Thank you for your question. It's fascinating. It's a, it's, it's a great point. And um, my thinking about it is that we frame it many times from a privacy perspective and also kind of that was the topic of the panel. But the danger to me is that a lot of human rights are about freedom and the freedom of not having information, the ethical of not. And all of these technologies have a lot of power of changing that freedom the way in which they point in different directions for decision makers. They create a different society that, uh, yes, has a privacy impact, but even if you would say the data is not private, all of the outputs and how they are used and the discrimination that they cause because different people have access to different <coughs> things may actually be very problematic from the perspective you're saying. And I would love to talk more about what is for you like this violation of human rights because that is actually a point that many times gets missed, in particular from uh, technical people that we hear them I mean, with technology, right? Technology is kind of agnostic to anything. And we hear a lot from privacy, but we never hear a lot from that side, and that is actually great, and we could work with that. Okay. I'll try to, to answer the, all the questions. So starting with, with your comment uh, about do you need new regulation, etc. I'll put to you that uh, it's even a bit dangerous to, and, and, and you see that it's uh, Facebook that is always calling for more regulation, it's Google that says that we need frameworks. I was this morning at Paulo Wilson in one of these discussions about, uh, about AI and human rights and Google was already saying, oh, we need new frameworks, etc. I think there is a danger of keeping saying that we need new frameworks because we already do have one that is legally binding and per perhaps at this point in time if we see the backlash that we have against international institutions, against multilateralism, perhaps there will be no appetite from states to renegotiate and, and have so uh, s s such a level of protection. So I think at this point in time we should perhaps stand with what we have, uh, with the framework of uh, international human rights law that we have, and that can uh, be interpreted in a way. So if we take, uh, going to the European side, that it, it's a bit more of my comfort zone, if we think of Article 8 ECHR about uh, the rights to private life, family life correspondence, I don't think in 1950-51 correspondence was electronic email, but uh, the European Court of Human Rights could make the point that while uh, correspondent is nowadays electronic email and, and, and maybe other types of data and that the, the protection of uh, private life also encompass your DNA data and also encompass any other types of uh, digital data that, that is uh, coming up from the case law of the European Court from, from a while ago. So I believe that there is this danger of calling from our regulation all the time and I believe that we should really implement the uh, human rights framework that we already have, not just on privacy and then the connected uh, right of data protection, but also other types of rights. So one point that we haven't covered today, but that is quite important, is discrimination. So non-discrimination is quite important in the digital world and uh, should be there because algorithms and uh, machine learning can build on data, it's very data driven as uh, Carmel was saying and uh, it can encompass a number of biases that at the end of the day can lead to discrimination in the real world and so that, that's complicated. Now um, 
for the existing for uh, yeah there are a number of uh, existing for uh, of, of activities and i think too many at the moment there are so many declarations of principles and guidelines on ethics of ai that have been proliferating expert groups at eu level at international level a number of initiatives uh, encompassing international organizations academia the uh, United Nations has uh, rightly so taken uh, the lead at the moment uh, looking at these questions as well. I think we need to make sense of all of these because it's really a proliferation of uh, instruments and which perhaps would lead to a fatigue of uh, so many declarations, so many guidelines and so many principles that are put forward. So perhaps uh, a good for would be to have the, the multilateral one uh, with the UN uh, leading at the forefront. And, and, and they are taking the initiative, at least this week, we have a whole week of talking about governance of AI um, under the office of the OHCHR. And then for your last point, I have, okay, I try to cover it. I think the, the privacy question is interesting because there are several layers of privacy. So. Taking a standpoint from a legal side, we just have one, one aspect of that. Uh, I work a lot with uh, uh, people in computer science, but also people in psychology, for example, and the concepts of privacy there are very different because what I consider as being my private domain has implications, a domino effect, towards other people's privacy. So what uh, I share in an email with uh, my father has an impact on his privacy as well as mine. <coughs> and then if he shares it with my mother, then there would have an impact on her. So, so you see, it, it's more of a, that, well, research saying we have several layers or several uh, concentric circles of privacy that are also interesting. And from a legal perspective, we'll try to just analyze it from a very basic sense. But yeah, there is a little bit more to it. Thanks very much. Thanks for coming to this event this afternoon. There's one last thing to do. Please join me in thanking our panelists for a fascinating. <laughs>